which was a 211 map. Today we are going to try to introduce some tools that are good to study some perturbation of this, of this linear system. Like if you have a nonlinear system very close to this cut map, how can you prove some topological uh, like properties? Like for instance, I'm going to prove that if you have a, if you have a perturbation of the 211, you still have the property of being topologically mixing. So, as usual, we always have our favorite 211 map, and it induces a map on the two torus, as we have been seeing all the time. And as it was said repeatedly, if you look at it on the square, at every point we have, we have two eigendirections that are orthogonal. But one we denote by the eigenspace, which is EU, which is associated to the eigenvalue, which is bigger than one, and the other one, which is ES. And it has this property that this is the whole space. This is like R2. If you take the, the, the subspace generated by the stable and unstable eigenspace, they, are, they have a direct sum. It's always transverse. They are, in particular, orthogonal for this map. And it also has this nice property, like why do we call it like a hyperbolic system? Like we have two eigenvalues, lambda, which was n, 1 over lambda r. Again, values of A. And we have that, we have this property that if, um, if we apply DFA at a point X to a vector VSX, we have, it is 1 over lambda times VSX, VS at FAX. And DF a x applied to a vector. After I will tell you what these vectors are. Of course, lambda times v u at f a x. So where v u and v x is a like a like a choice of vectors that lies on e s and e u. Like you choose an orientation that works globally for all the points. In that case, you you have a a family of vectors like a a vector fields that Vs defines v, v sigma defines a unit vector field in E sigma for sigma equals SU. So this is a very important property in hyperbolic system, which is saying that this, this is an invariant splitting. This is invariant by the dynamics. Like, invariant splitting, meaning if I take DFA x applied to E sigma x, I get E sigma at f of x, which is uh, for sigma equals SU. And it has another property which is called hyperbolicity. Which is that if I take, so I use here the Euclidean norm that you have here on the square that comes just from the Euclidean from R2, dFA restricted to ES is equals to 1 over lambda, which is less than 1. And 1 is greater than lambda, which is DFA restricted to EU. So these are two properties that are very important in general in, in our study which is like invariant splitting and the hyperbolicity of the, of the splitting, like the, yeah. Okay, so for me, at least, 
when I, when I see this, this property for the first time, you see it for the cut map, you can see it easily. But to see that this property is a kind of robust under perturbation, I could not see it just by this definition. At least for me, I could not see like, if I perturb, if I perturb F A a little bit, like if I take F A plus some perturbation like Amy did in the, in the class by adding epsilon signs of something, so I could not see exactly why I should still preserve, like have invariant splitting for the new dynamics and have hyperbolicity for the new dynamics. Now there is a very interesting tool which I think it helps a lot to see that this is a very like robust condition. It, it is preserved under perturbation. And that leads us to introduce the notion of cone fields. So today we will use tools from invariant cone fields. So, so let's let's stick to the stick to the let's stick to this map to the cut map because we are going to, to, to study perturbation of the cut map. So we just define invariant cone fields for the cut map. You will see it, the definition is very general. So given alpha positive and x in T2, you define the stable cone fields. Stable cone at x, so stable cone at x by C S X of angle alpha, which is defined to be the set of vector V, which any vector V here, you know that you can write it as a direct sum of vector here and here. So you have V S plus V U. Now you have the condition that it should be in the cone, meaning the V U is less than alpha Vs. So you see that this defines a cone of, of angle alpha. Like if you take a vector, you multiply by, 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 by a real number, you get the vector you get is also in the cone. Similarly, you have unstable. So here I am writing this. I'm, I'm just meaning the usual Euclidean norm on R2. U, which is defined by V, Vs plus Vu. Just the reverse. It will be a cone around the unstable direction, alpha. U. So this, this this gives me at every for every alpha I have a family of cone. At every point I have a cone. Like here. You will have this is a cone C U at a point X of angle alpha. Also around E S I have the same. This is C S x alpha. I mean, it's clear, to, it's clear that you can see this is a cone around the stable, because if vu is 0, this is trivially satisfied. One very important thing about the, this cone field is their invariance by the dynamics, which I said here. So there is this fact. I don't know if I should write it as a lemma, or, but it's very simple to see that for every x and t2 and alpha positive, we have, what do we have? We have that dfa applied to cu x alpha is exactly equal. This has to do with the fact that the map is linear, but I will tell you what we have in the general case is Cu at Fax 
1 over lambda square alpha, which is a subset, which is a cone inside the cone. Like, it's obvious, see you at fax alpha, because this uh, lambda is bigger than 1. Similarly, for the unstable cone, for the stable cone, we have the invariance, but in the backward, applying backward, it reads ds at f minus 1 a x 1 over lambda square alpha, which is uh, inside the cone of angle alpha, strictly. This is, a, this is a very important property of this cone, saying that stable cone is invariant in backward and unstable cone is invariant forward. Let me tell you what the picture you have. Let's say here we have x and here we have f a x here. I have the unstable direction which is here and this is a cone I have of angle alpha. This is alpha. Here also, I have the unstable direction, which is here. And here, I have the same angle alpha. So the invariance is telling you that if you take this, the image of this by the derivative by the differential of fa, which is a, just a linear map, it is mapped strictly inside. So this will be mapped to an angle uh, lambda minus 2 times alpha. So this is strictly mapped inside here. So maybe, uh, is it clear to everyone that this is true? One could just try to, one could just write, you take a vector v in, OK, proof. You take a vector v in Cu, x alpha. You, you write v as vs plus vu, the, 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 uh, using the splitting. And you see that dfa v equals 1 over lambda times vs Oh, I should, I should, I should, I should, okay, I should use the, because I define this as being the unit vector, so I should use some coefficients here, eta s and eta u. So what you will have is it will be 1 over lambda eta s times v s plus lambda eta u times v u. For any vector, you can do this, and you see clearly that the ratio between this and this, you will have 1 over lambda squared times the original factor. And the other way also is clearly satisfied using the fact that the inverse has uh, the eigenvalues that are just uh, inverse of each other. Is it clear that for the, for the 2 one, one map, I have invariance of the cones given like this. Here I have an equality, actually because of the linearity. Yes? Sorry? Yes? You apply the Jacobian. Yes. Yes. It, it, it does not open it, so it squeeze it around stable and stretch it along unstable. You squeeze along, along stable. This is squeezing here, and this is stretching. So that's what you see here. This cone will get this and this. That's just hyperbolicity. You squeeze and you stretch. Huh? Yes. 
Okay, this is a very, very, very important tool. Why is it important now? So now I can I can study the perturbation of the of the of the cut map. Of FA. Let's consider like let F epsilon. This is that the norm of F epsilon minus F C1 norm is less than epsilon. C1 norm meaning the norm of the, ma of, the, of the C0 norm and the norm of the derivative, like the maps that are close in the C1 norm. So the claim is that so I fix, I have, I know I have uh, invariant cone field for the cut map. I want to say that the same cone fields are invariant by perturbation of the map. So given alpha positive, that exists epsilon such that there exists epsilon and lambda bar, which is probably not one over lambda, says that d f epsilon at, uh -huh. ah, yes, 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 yes. So how should I call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not exactly the same. Kappa, okay. Okay. Df epsilon of C U X alpha is in C U X kappa alpha uh, f of x f epsilon x and can you see here and df epsilon minus 1 at c s x alpha is in c s f minus 1 x kappa alpha. So I have the cut map. I have the 2 one, one map. I have invariant splitting. I build a cone around this invariant splitting, and I'm claiming that the same cone is invariant by applying the differential of a perturbation of the cut map. But you see, this is easy. It just follows from the, the continuity, right? Because you see what you have. Let me write the picture again. So I'm here at x. I have the cone of angle alpha. I'm here at f a x. I know that this guy is mapped strictly inside. There is like a there is a there is a space here. So this is like lambda minus two times alpha. So if I take a perturbation of the map, so x will not be mapped exactly to f a x. It will be mapped to somewhere very close. So let's say x is mapped to somewhere f. You can make it as close as you want by choosing, by choosing epsilon small. In which case, if you draw here also the curve, the, 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 the cone that you have here, the, the family of cone is continuous. You can choose them so that it is continuous, so the angle it changes, the, the cone changes continuously. So what you have, if this guy is mapped strictly inside here, the image of this guy also uh, by, so this was by d f a and by d f epsilon 
it will be also strictly mapped inside here. I don't know, my picture is very messy. You guys forgive me. This follows just because this is continuous. If you look, this is the same. It is a continuous family of corn. And the differential, I change it just a little bit. So I will preserve the, the, the invariance of the corn. Is that more or less clear? Okay, now what is good now about this, about the invariance of corn? Actually, one can see that it is exactly equivalent to hyperbolicity, what I define here. I will do that. I, I, I plan to give that as an exercise in the, in the, in the, in the afternoon. Prove that this property, like this property here in the claim, let's denote it by star, star imply that there exists and not, such that for all x in T2, we have T x T2, the tangent space of the torus, splits into two new bundles. So I will denote it by tilde, just because it has to do with the perturbation, or I should put an epsilon. Okay. And it is invariant, df epsilon applied to E sigma tilde x is exactly E f epsilon x sigma for sigma equals su and 2i. If you wait long enough, you will see the same hyperbolicity happening. Yeah. That df and not restricted to es tilde is strictly less than one, which is strictly less than df and not restricted to eu. So here we see what I was saying about the, the, like the fact that the hyperbolicity is robust. Because I have the cut map, I have corn fields, I put up the cut map a little bit, the corn field will remain in variance, and here the exercise is telling you that invariance of corn field like that implies the existence of a splitting, and the, which is invariant and which is hyperbolic. Okay, that's good. So this, Actually, yes, 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 yes. If you have this for some alpha, just for some alpha, you don't need it for any alpha. You have this two property, now you can, you can, yeah? Yes. Can you say it louder? What depends on? Yes. Yes. The change is continuous. So this dFA minus dF epsilon is less than epsilon, the C0 norm, C0 norm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay. Sorry? Ah, yes, F epsilon, yes, thank you, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So actually, this, let me just look at my note to do not mix the, the step of what I want to say. So I'm here. Yes. So actually, this family of, of map that have this splitting and the hyperbolicity, it belongs to a like, bigger family, what we call the uniform hyperbolic systems or the Anosov systems as well. So invariant splitting.
plus hyperbolicity this defines what we call uniform hyperbolic maps or Anosov diffuse. So this, what, we, what I just sketched for the CAD map, it tells you that we have two facts. Like the fact that the, the being Anosov is an open condition, is C1 open. That's a very important fact, just using cone fields. Like, if I have an of diffeomorphism, what I do, you can do it for anyone. Like, if you have an of diffeomorphism, what you just think of, you have the splitting and you have the hyperbolicity, you can build your cone around this invariant splitting and you have the invariance of the cone field, so you will have the invariance of cone field for a perturbation of the map, C1 perturbation, because you see I, have, I use the fact that the differential is closed, like they are closed in the C1 topology. And another property that I want to say, I don't want to forget anything. Okay, yeah, I said, so, so having invariant cone fields is equivalent to being hyperbolic, like being Anosov, okay? So we come back to, to, the, to, to the perturbation. Now what we want to prove is that the perturbation is, is uh, topologically mixing, F epsilon, for the cut map, okay? The proof I will give here is, I mean, it has highly, I mean, it's, it's, it has to do with the fact that I am in this square and I am perturbing a very specific, it has to do with the geometry of the domain, but there are other proof using uh, other techniques, okay? Just to tell you. So this is our next goal. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point. Thank you for bringing that up. So the thing is, the fact that you have cornfields, just invariant of cornfields doesn't see what is happening inside. It doesn't tell you whether inside you have expansion of contraction, but it just tells you the relative, like, uh, the domination. Like, the vectors in EU, their norm dominates the vectors in ES. So it doesn't tell you which this one is contracting or expanding, but it tells you that you have what we call dominated splitting. Like, like it just tells you this, for instance, without the one. Uh, yeah, for two dimension, it just tells you this without the one. That's very important. But in our case, since we are perturbing the cut map, we can we we we, we use the fact that uh, the diff it's a C1 perturbation, so you you still have the contraction and expansion. Thank you. So our goal is to prove that the cut map, the perturbation F epsilon is topologically mixing. I mean, since I want to save time, I will just tell you, remind you what topologically mixing was. This was the definition of topologically mixing. So any two open sets you take, there is an iterate after which these two open sets, they always intersect after that iterate. Like if you iterate one, yeah. So how do, we, how do we prove this? To prove this, there is a, some technicality, some technicality that has to do with the geometry of the, of the space that we're considering that we have to use here. What is the geometric property of the, 
of the, of the cut map. So I write this fact from the cut map, and after we can discuss how it follows. So that exists are positive such that any piece of table and unstable manifold okay of fa of the cut map intersect at least uh, uh, any piece of of lengths at least L intersect so that any what am I saying here is that if I consider the cut map so I have eigenspaces that is doing this and this this is the unstable eigenspace and there is the unstable eigenspace which is also orthogonal to it I'm saying that you can fix the specific lengths for the piece. I mean, I'm considering these two, it's in the torus, so this is just one piece of unstable manifold. So any two pieces that I consider from here also, you see very well if I go unstable like this, it will intersect. So what I'm basically saying is that there exists a, a length. It just has to do with the angle, with the angle of the, of the unstable direction with the angle that it makes here, which is irrational and, yeah. Can we believe this? So, if you have this fact, now, oops, I'm running, I'm very slow. Okay. Yes. So, yes. So there is also this observation. Observation is that if you take limit when alpha goes to zero of, of C, S, C sigma X alpha, you get exactly E sigma X. This is trivial, right? This is trivial. Like this cone is around for sigma equals SU. So what I derive from this property is that now I can fix an alpha such that any piece of curve that is tangent to the cone, any two pieces of curve that are tangent to stable and unstable cone respectively of a certain length will intersect. gamma S and gamma U in tangent to stable, tangent to CS. So I should say there exists alpha, tangent to C alpha and C respectively and length of gamma s and length of gamma u bigger than l we have gamma s intersect gamma u is not empty because what is this basically saying? So I, if I make alpha very small, what I get is a curve that is very close to being, to being the stable manifold. 
for instance, if I take a curve in CS alpha, where alpha is very small, I get a curve very close to the C1, to the stable, to the stable manifold. So from this fact, I can choose alpha small enough such that any curve of a certain length will intersect. Any two curves of a certain length will intersect. Now, having this, having this, I can, I can now come to the perturbation because this is a very useful fact for the cones because I know the cone hold, like the invariance of cone holds for the perturbation. So I can, this facts, okay. So what do we have here is that now, so what do I need to prove is, is that if I take two open sets on my torus, actually there is a picture for this, I should use it, nice picture. I take two open sets, I want to find one iterate for which this guy, for instance, keep intersecting the other one. So what do I do? I take the a curve, so remember I want to prove F epsilon. By choosing epsilon small enough, depending on how alpha is, I can guarantee that the, the vectors, the, I can guarantee that a curve that is staying inside the stable, inside the stable cone will get stretched like this. Why is that? Because you can just, you can just look at what is f minus epsilon, minus of minus one epsilon gamma, this curve. Let's say you consider this, you call it gamma one. You take the gamma inside the stable cone, the stable cone given by alpha. So you can see that the length of this curve is growing. And as the length is growing, the angle, the cone is getting narrower and narrower, so you, 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 you can still apply this, this fact. So what will happen is that length of gamma n that exists from m such that length of gamma m will be bigger than gamma m. Yeah, thank you. So I do this. Gamma is a piece of curve that I consider in the, in the stable cone of angle alpha. So gamma is a starting curve, which is the tangent vector to the curve is in the stable cone. And it's inside. It's inside of you, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, yes. <laughs> so I take a piece of curve inside you, because you might be very small. Maybe this curve, of, this curve gamma that I consider doesn't have the the lengths that I want to intersect. So what you do now, you iterate this curve backward, and you know stable, the, uh, the vectors in the stable cone, they expand when you go backward, so the curve is growing in lengths. Like, you have the limit of length of gamma n is going to infinity, as n goes to plus infinity. So you see the curve is growing in length because it is in the stable cone when you trade backward. So at some point, it will achieve my good length that any other unstable piece of the, any other unstable curve in the unstable cone of that length would intersect this one. So here you, you are lucky. Just here you can see intersection, but you can really go further to see that, that the other one also will achieve the certain length so that you cannot avoid intersection. And this proves mixing. Right? It proves, actually, yeah, it proves that whenever you do a perturbation, you, having this geometry of my space, you, you remain mixing okay. using cone fields. And uh, yeah, so I have about seven minutes, and I wanted to, to give some kind of motivation, like why? Why do we care about this mass? Why do we care about having splitting? Why do we care about having cone fields? 
So for that, I would like to just play a video that I like very much. That comes from the Lorentz equation, this famous Lorentz equation that you all know. When we look at the movement of the atmosphere, we quickly realize that it is infinitely more complex than that of the solar system. The atmosphere is a fluid that has, at each altitude above each point of the Earth's surface, a speed, a density, a pressure, a temperature, and so on. All of this data varies over time. It is, of course, impossible to understand this practically infinite amount of data. It is almost as if we were in a space with an infinite number of dimensions. To understand something about it, we must make approximations. In 1963, Edward Lorenz simplified and simplified and simplified the problem again. He simplified it to such a degree that there is no guarantee that his equation has anything to do with reality. His model of the atmosphere was reduced to just three numbers, x, y, and z. The evolution of the atmosphere was reduced to a simple equation. Each point x, y, z, in space, represents a state of the atmosphere. The evolution follows a vector field. For example, and this is only an example, the first coordinate could represent the temperature, the second, the wind speed, and the third, the humidity. Over here, it is cold, breezy, and raining. Here, the opposite holds. When we follow a trajectory of the field, we are following the evolution of the weather. The weatherman just needs to solve a differential equation. This is what Lorenz saw when he studied his model. Does this have anything to do with real weather? That is far from clear. This is what physicists often call a toy model, used to try and understand the broad outlines of some complex behavior. In fact, Lorenz only had these sorts of graphs to look at because his computer in 1963 was quite primitive. Let's look at two atmospheres represented by the centers of these two balls that are extremely close together. So close, they are almost identical. Let's observe what happens to them. At first, the two evolutions are almost indistinguishable. But then, they split up significantly the two atmospheres become completely different. This then is chaos, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So I wanted to show you this to tell you that this system that we're considering, like the uniform hyperbolic system, they belong to a bigger system, which are the chaotic system, which has this notion of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Like if you look at, let's say, uh, two points on the same unstable manifolds, you see that their feature look very different. 
You know, they do very different things, even though to start with they were very, very close. So this system that we consider in the uniform hyperbolic system, they have the, the sensitive dependence on initial condition. And actually, for this system, the Lorentz system, maybe time will not allow me because I want to talk about something else very soon. You could, you could like what we do in our, in our fields is we, we introduce what is called the geometric model. And the geometric model is a vector field that looks like exactly like the floor near the, sing, near, near, near the origin. And you can study what is called the point car section. The point car section will look something like this. So I'm in my three-dimensional space. The geometric, of the, Lorentz, the geometric model of the Lorentz flow is something like this. And what does it do? It, it takes, you have here this line, it takes this and maps it to something like this. So this is really, I'm giving a very rough idea of what's going on here to see the invariance of these bundles for the point color section. What happened here is that if you take a, here you have the family of, for some parameters, you have a family of these vertical lines. What happened is that these vertical lines, they get maps to vertical lines again. Like this guy will be mapped to vertical line here for some parameters. And this is really uh, uh, showing you that you have some, in, some like invariant splitting. And you have also the contraction because also for the parameter for this exact equation, the map is strongly dissipative. You have this area contracting, so you, you see a lot of hyperbolicity. But nevertheless, there is something more important. Okay. Should I say more or should I? Okay. Yeah. So there is a lot to say about this, but I think the time will not allow me to elaborate, so I will stop here. If there are questions, okay.